welcome to Adam Interactions. Uh, today we're speaking to somebody who's sitting all the way across the country, so we're doing it on Zoom. We're speaking to Ms. Uh, Tulsi K. Raj. She's a writer and a lawyer who practices at the High Court of Kerala and at the Supreme Court of India. She is interested in constitution law and theory and anti-discrimination law and law and religion and comparative human rights. And today we will be discussing the oncoming appointment of uh, Justice B.Y. Chandrachud as the Chief Justice of India for the next two years. Welcome to Adam Interaction. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. Um, I think for me personally, as somebody who belongs to the young generation of, of Indians, Justice Chandrachud has always provided a certain um, release and relief when thinking about the future of our country, especially with the oncoming rise of a right wing or, or the, or the you know, uh, continued rise of the right wing. It is interesting to see directly clashing ideas being enforced at the constitutional level. Now, how do you view the importance of Justice Chandrachud becoming the CGI for the Indian uh, judiciary and the Indian society? Right. It's an interesting question, and it's, of course, very, very contemporary to discuss this when uh, Justice Chandrachud has been uh, uh, recommended as the next Chief Justice to follow um, Chief, the current Chief Justice, who is uh, outgoing, Chief Justice Lalit. But I think I'll begin with the caveat. I'll begin with the caveat that uh, we should not, uh, I think, um, be fast in glorifying judges. I think that's one of the one of the important problems that Indian judiciary faces today, that it's, it's an institution and it's, of course, judges are important political actors, but it's relevant to remember that they hold significant political power, right? right? And the, the, if you look at the kind of protection that the judges have, if you look at the kind of privilege that a judge holds in this country and looking at the kind of, the, the, just, the sheer scope of the power, it's just immense. Right. And because of this, this power that they hold, uh, I would think that the, the, accountability that they have is also equally huge. And it is in that context that we should, I think, uh, discuss about any judge for that matter and the contribution of any individual ju judge uh, in, you know, in, this, in this particular uh, uh, context. It, it's important to view this uh, in, in this context because very often we see uh, you know, judges being discussed in sort of a very, very uh, you know, isolated view without looking at the overall background in which the Indian right. judiciary is situated and the kind of kind of political uh, background that we have. Right. So that, I mean, that uh, uh, context aside, it's true that as you as you rightly said, the liberal uh, uh, Indian side is of course, uh, it seems to be at least quite happy with uh, yeah. the <laughs> judgments rendered by Justice Chandra Chud and, and his interventions in, in, in various uh, proceedings. And uh, as far as the new uh, Chief Justice term is concerned, it's going to be quite huge and significant. So if you look, if you just compare the term of Justice Lalit, it's been less than three months. Yes. And the tenure of Justice Chancellor is, of course, going to be huge. It's almost going to be uh, two years. Um, and that is a, is a significant time for you know, making various contributions in his position as the Chief Justice. And of course, the Chief Justice of India holds significant um, powers, uh, including he is the master of the roster. And that's that's only the beginning of the of the kind of powers that he will enjoy. So of course, there is an immense potential and there is a lot of hope um, from Justice Chandrachud who is going to be the next Chief Justice. So I, I think I'm hopeful in this, uh, you know, in this context, and I just hope that he, uh, brings forward the kind of reforms that has all that have already been launched by Justice Lalit, which a lot of lawyers and a lot of the general public are quite happy with. Uh, the reforms in the matter of listing, the the very fact that Constitution bench uh, benches were set up in the Supreme Court, important matters, including the hijab controversy, including the EWS reservation amendment, the fact that all these were finally, after a long wait, were heard in the Supreme Court. Uh, itself shows that the Supreme Court is at least currently going in a in a better path than uh, what was going on before. So the hope is that uh, Justice Chandra is just able to make things go uh, even better, and that that I mean that would be the the hope for um, the incoming Chief Justice. 
how do you respond to his um, very crucial judgments with respect to personal liberty affirmative action and even gender justice right uh, the, of course there have been and and he's known for uh, championing these values of liberty and values of autonomy so we have of course a series of judgments um starting from the atar judgment in which right. uh, justice chandra jud held that the right to privacy is part of uh, uh, a part 3 of the constitution it's it's a fundamental right and that was declared categorically and comprehensively for the first time and that that it, that itself advanced uh, indian constitutional law and jurisprudence to a significant extent considering the lack of clarity which we had on a lot of rights and in this case the right to privacy and we also of course have the reading down of section 377 of the indian penal code which uh, penalized um, same sex uh, intercourse and that was in the thing jawhar as we are all aware of that was read down and significant um, that was a significant ruling and it made a certain very important observations as well as liberty as well as privacy as well as individual autonomy is concerned and the, the, and it also talked about the kind of intervention that the state can just not uh, do when it comes to you know individual right. private sexual affairs which it's it's that it is it is it just reminded i think the state of the fact that it's none of its business to just interfere in these aspects which are very crucial to individual autonomy and dignity we also have the joseph shine judgment um in 2018 where uh, justice chandra chud was part of the bench and uh, section 497 of the uh, indian penal code was was struck down as violative of articles uh, 14 15 and uh, 21 inclu- and a few other uh, provisions of the constitution were of, also referred to and the discriminatory provision which is in actually said that only men can be punished for um, committing right. adultery and women are uh, married um cannot be uh, penalized for it so that was a very clear discriminatory provision and that was and and there was also an aspect of privacy and dignity in the same uh, in the same case and that was and chandra's judgment uh, echoes these values and talks about the importance of again uh, you know the importance of having uh the norm of gender equality as the cornerstone of uh, of indian constitutional law uh there have also been in, in terms of jurisprudence as well uh he has significantly contributed we know of the colonel natisha case where um the doctrine of indirect discrimination was again categorically laid down for the first time and that was another uh, significant ruling ruling by uh, justice chandra chu we also have the dissenting opinion in the bhima korigon case where it was the sole dissenter uh when it came to a significant you know significant uh aspect of sending political activists or penalizing political activists for what is essentially their political opinion or what is essentially their political work and the fact that the majority government is unhappy with certain things the the ruling government is uncomfortable with the kind of social work that certain people do whether that can itself be a reason for uh, you know sending people to prison and for uh, importantly indefinitely keeping them behind bars so all these i mean the various aspects such as these were addressed um and of course as far as the development of of indian judicial indian constitutional law is concerned there has been uh, uh, there ha- there have been significant advancements in all these judgments and of course all these judgments deserve uh, the, the credit uh, for 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 their contribution but i think at, at the same time it's important to remember that uh, justice chandra jud was also part of the ayodhya judgment the for you see, we can see these contradictions i think i think that was also one of the one of the things that you were raising as a concern earlier so we know that uh whenever we talk about all these values and and the kind of uh, constitutional norms which are highlighted in the judgments the the you know the the advancement of the jurisprudence on the one side we also know that you know it's very difficult to unilaterally say that something is completely positive because we have judiciary of course is an institution and the institution will always be assessed on the basis of its its, its conduct and it's the kind of judgments that individual judges deliver 
So it's going to be a, a you know, it, it's going to be a mix uh, of contradictions. It's going to be uneven. The kind of comparison is going to be incoherent, and that is just inherent with the with the with the analysis of the judicial itself, because it's just you know a, a mix of people coming from different ideologies, coming from just different backgrounds, and you just conceive of the institution as a singular entity, and that is that is that is the only way to criticize it. Therefore, I think it is important to pause and, you know, take a step back and think of uh, the evaluation of judges in a holistic way. And I think, and this is not, of course, a criticism of an individual judge, but of the judiciary as a whole. That if you look at the kind, the way in which the judiciary was performing in the last few years, especially after the uh, after the coming into uh, power of the first NDA government in 2014, we will see that the judiciary has been uh, slow in directly confronting the union government in a lot of ways. And that's uh, that's interesting to note since the, the court has, of course, struck down provisions, including criminal provisions, struck the court has, of course, been uh, take, the court has taken decisions which were, you know, which were against the union government in, in a lot in a lot of ways, but we still see that there have that you know there have not been occasions where there has been a direct confrontation between uh, uh, the court on the one side and the government on the other, and that kind of direct confrontation, that kind of uh, at you know very very uh, uh, strong uh, conflict between these two institutions were rare. So we of course have you know judgments which talk about all these all these values in the abstract, right? We have judgments which talk about auto autonomy. We have judgments talking about uh, individual liberty. We have judgments talking about equality. We we have all all of all of that. But if you look at you know concrete issues where the union government really is 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 uh, serious or is is, is is there is something that's part of the government's political agenda that's indispensable to their political agenda we have not okay. seen i would think as much a conflict as we would like to see you know yeah. and that uh, we will and an analysis of that can be done by looking at the sensitive issues if you look at the kashmir issue we look at you know the the issue of access of access to internet in kashmir we look at certain other issues which just go to the root of what makes the current government what it is, what makes the current ruling party, the BJP, what it is. Then we see that the, the court has been sort of slowing down its approach as to how it wants to, you know, modulate that confrontation. And that's that's problematic, I think. And this is yeah. how I would think that we should balance the kind of, you know, judgments which lay down abstract yeah. values of uh, constitutional liberty with with the actual political reality that we have in this yeah. country, and yeah. that kind of balance, I think, will give us a holistic analysis of uh, of both the the you know the contribution of individual judges as well as the the uh, role of judiciary as a whole. Right, and it's it's so definitely put the fact that the abstract notions and cases and conflicts were resolved so beautifully, according to a left liberal, whereas where things genuinely matter and affect. In, in real time, it, there's this inconsistency rather, which is why the question of, on one hand, we have Ayodhya verdict, and on the other hand, we have Shabri Mala. It, it always confused me. When it came to that point, I was like, uh, where is he actually allied? What does this man's politics actually tell us? Um, now, coming back to this idea of abstract notions that exist on paper, essentially, how do we uh, kind of quantify uh, social justice affected by the judiciary in in real time. And, and just to go back to something that Justice Chandrachud said, there's a beautiful quote where he said that it is difficult to write a wrong by history, but we can set the course for the future. How do you, as a practitioner of law, how do you see the distance between a judicial verdict and effect of it in, in, in social conversation? Right. I think uh, the the quote that you were uh, referring to was from the Navdej judgment. Yes, yes. And that was beautiful indeed. And of course, it you know it speaks volumes about you know criminalizing conduct which 
is in fact part of person's autonomy and liberty it's just of criminalizing conduct just because the society thinks that something is abnormal the society yeah. thinks that something is unnatural and then the society just imposes you on, on, on certain person who just disagrees with the society on this and that of course the that aspect is definitely there and i'm not saying these judgments are unimportant in any way the the way the contributions have been uh made should be given due credit uh, but as far as advancing social justice is concerned it, i think it comes down to how we define social justice i think it's it's a it's complicated to understand this because we live in a political reality where if you compare how indian society functioned even even 10 years ago before uh, uh, before the um, uh, uprising of the Hindu right, at least to this kind of extent. Of course, the, the presence of Hindu right wing was all, all, always there in Indian society that we never completely went away. But the kind of strength that they've gotten, the kind of legitimacy that they've derived from the current government, I think is that is something that's unprecedented. And if, if you look at what social justice means in this context, I would think that as far as Indian Muslims are concerned, Indian minorities are concerned, Indian marginalized communities are, are concerned, there have been tremendous setbacks. And I think we have gone at, at 50 years back in the last okay, uh, two regimes. And that, that, and that, is, that is problematic. And if we ask the question of how this pol this particular political problem that is marginalization of Indian Muslims, the rise of Indian Hindutva, how that has been addressed with the judiciary, I don't think we will be very happy with the answers. And that is why this sort of, uh, you know, as, as, as you were earlier pointing out, the, the contradictions are also very strange and very difficult to make sense of. We have this, you know, this, this liberal way, a wave on the one hand, where we have unconstitutional legislation being struck down, we have judges uh, highlighting and talking about the importance of individual liberty, we have the Hadia case where judges uh, said uh, that it's important to ask the woman what she wants, it's important to uh, give uh, you know credit to her choice rather than anything else that the society might think or what her parents might think or what we might have as prejudices it just comes down to one individual person and what ultimately she wants to do with her life and we have all these progressive judgments we have the judgment on reproductive rights and that is also of course discussed in, in detail and, and uh, talked about uh, in, in public arena but when we have that wave going on on the one hand and at the same time we have a sort of hesitation that the judiciary is generally showing with respect to you know interference and the kind of intolerance that we see in society and the kind of media reporting that we see we see that the judiciary is holding back and not being as intrusive as it as we would like it to as interventionist as we would like it to and that that and that is the that is the, that is i think acknowledging that problem is is significant and the question is how you know how much the new chief, chief justice will be able to um, uh, achieve the, or, or, you know, achieve, uh, first of all, recognize this uh, uh, lack of balance when it comes yeah. to the judiciary's role and what it can do to address it. Right. For me, I feel like what you pointed out so rightly about not isolating uh, personas within within the judiciary system and looking at things hol holistically, that's something definitely that I've like learned from this conversation. It's important to look at the larger picture and I think understand that India lives in these contradictions and these divides and these parts and who does the judiciary cater to? Whose democracy are we protecting? Like that question does come out of this conversation. Uh, and I think that's pretty much uh, it. <laughs> I would love to continue this conversation for a long time, but I don't think uh, we have time for that today. And so... Yeah, thank you very much for giving very detailed answers and very like strong opinions about the questions that I asked. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Thank you for being here. I thought the questions were very, very relevant and interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I and I hope, you know, I think it will be great to kind of have after this conversation, I can now think and reflect about the next two years and what will actually happen in real time after uh, the new Chief Justice takes charge. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much.